This is Twit. Under the headline, boy, that's got to hurt, is the news that the world's second largest by trading volume, second largest major cryptocurrency exchange was, as they say, taken to the cleaners by a group of quite determined North Korean hackers to the tune of, is everybody sitting down? Grip your steering wheel firmly if you're if you're listening to this during your morning commute. One point five billion dollars worth of completely liquid Ethereum tokens. One point five billion dollars. Wow. This makes it the largest crypto heist ever in history. Probably the, the second, largest heist in history, it is, right? It is. How are you going to steal one point five billion from a, you know, armored car? I mean, yes, the, it is the bank. largest I mean, heist of any kind yeah. in history of the world, um, and it's nearly two and a half times larger than their previous record, which was the theft of six hundred twenty-five million dollars from the Ronin Network back in April of twenty twenty-two. So. I have a link in the show notes at the bottom of page 12 showing the fraudulent transaction event on the Ethereum blockchain, where 401,346.76888, I mean, it goes on forever, you know, with decimal, ETH are being transferred. That transfer was fraudulent. Ethereum peaked at around $4,000 each in early December of last year and is currently trading around $2,800 US dollars, which if you multiply 2,800 by 401,346, you get around one and a half billion dollars of liquidity that this that a, 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 the, the second largest group, which is BitPay, lost. Okay, so the hack took place just last Friday, February 21st. And in addition to being the single largest crypto heist ever, it's also considered to be one of the most complex crypto heists ever. You know, parenthetically, kudos to Bybit, because we wouldn't know all these details if they hadn't been very transparent. Yes, they were. And they, they have not been sunk. They, they said, we've got the liquidity to cover this. You know, this does not put us out of business. But uh, they're not happy about it. But yeah, yes, they, no. they, they were very upfront. Um, so the most, not only the biggest, but the most complex crypto heist, the blockchain analytics firm, uh, Arkham Intelligence and or firms Arkham Intelligence and also the the intelligence firm Elliptic have independently claimed that they were able to track the hack to the Lazarus Group, which is a well-known North Korean advanced persistent group, an APT group. What we know is that Lazarus first infiltrated um, Bybit's network some time ago. They then quietly studied the company's internal procedures, identified and then infected with malware all of the multiple employees who are now required to mutually sign off on any major movement of the company's funds. This multi-sign-off requirement is obviously designed to solve the problem of any single employee being hacked or fished or scammed or whatever, but that didn't thwart the attack this time. The hackers specifically targeted the process of replenishing the company's active wallets, known as hot wallets, where the company's daily operational funds are stored. When hot wallets run dry or low, crypto exchanges will move funds from their reserves, from the so-called cold wallets, to make sure there's enough liquidity to cover users' withdrawals and token inter-exchanges. The same goes for when hot wallets hold too much money, 
In those instances, crypto exchanges will move funds back off of the off back to the offline cold reserves to safeguard those reserves from malicious actors and, expl- and and exploits and limit possible losses. So, you know, that all makes sense. And actually, that's what saved these guys, right? Because they've got something like 10 billion in in total uh, reserve, only one and a half, only I'm saying, but still not all of it because they did have a bunch in cold storage and the bad guys didn't get that. But they did capture one massive transfer of 1.2 billion. Bybit's CEO Ben Cho says that when his staff wanted to replenish the hot wallets with new funds on Friday, the hackers altered the user interface of the crypto wallet software the company was using to move their funds. The modification appeared on the systems of every one of the multiple engineers who needed to simultaneously sign off in what is known as a multi-sig transaction. A tweet describing that that what happened reads, I have a tweet in the show notes from, from some random person who said, the attacker somehow, and then we've got four points. First, identified every multi-sig signer. Second, infected each signer's device with malware. Third, made the UI show a different transaction than what was actually being signed. Fourth, got all signers to approve without suspicion. And then he finished saying, cold wallet security just got redefined. Now, not surprisingly, Bybit's loss of that one and a half billion dollars in ethereal tokens did not go unnoticed. And since this makes many investors nervous about other potential weaknesses, Bybit's security, you know, weaknesses in and about Bybit's security, the company did say that news of the hack had led to a surge in withdrawal requests. Uh, CEO Cho wrote that the company had received more than 350,000 requests from customers to withdraw their funds and that this surge of departing money could lead to delays in processing. In response, Bybit set up a bounty for the recovery of the stolen funds. Get this offering to pay anyone who is able to recover the funds 10% of anything they're able to recover. I'll take it. (laughs) Uh This has, in turn, set off the biggest bounty hunt on the Internet, with the winners being eligible to earn up to a whopping $150 million, right? 10% of $1.5 billion. At the same time, not surprisingly, the perpetrators, who were naturally standing by and ready to deal with this massive windfall, quickly began laundering their funds in the hopes of hiding their tracks and diffusing the proceeds of their theft among the world's cryptocurrency exchanges. They're, you know, they're moving quickly because if they leave the funds in their normal wallets, they risk having them hacked back by multiple parties, including law enforcement, bounty hunters, and other threat actors. Another tweet observed, and this was from a VXDB, tweeted, Lazarus has started laundering the $1.4 billion stolen uh, ETH. And they said uh, uh, exch.cx, a no KYC exchange, has recorded an abnormal spike in ETH volume. 20K ETH in the past 24 hours versus its usual 800 ETH. Their Bitcoin reserves are also empty, but their ETH reserves have increased by 900%. So yes, that 1.5 billion is, you know, sloshing around within the internet's exchanges while North Korea tries to to uh, you know, tuck it away in in random corners of the internet so that it's not all in one place and hopefully 
you know, can't easily be, be tracked and recovered. And since, and you know, we know since blockchain activity can be monitored and tracked, uh, we now have a bit of a shell game underway. So what's our takeaway from this? If we're wise, every event teaches a lesson that prevents its recurrence. And hopefully others are also able to learn and gain from seeing what has befallen others and take away the same lessons without needing to first fall off the same cliff. In this case, I think the lesson here is that the systems which manage these massive cryptocurrency reserves need to be far more isolated from everyday systems than they currently are. In other words, they need to be fully air-gapped, with nothing less being sufficient. These are lessons that the professional intelligence community and those practicing the highest security in the world learned decades ago. And nothing we've done since with our computer and networking technology has served to make air gapping any less necessary. We could easily argue that, in fact, the reverse is true and that air gapping systems that absolutely and positively must never be compromised has grown more necessary today than ever before. I would bet that Bybit has just learned the same painful lesson. They obviously felt that requiring a multi-person, multi-keyed funds transfer authorization process would be sufficient. It's certainly better than requiring just one person. They just learned a one and a half billion dollar lesson, though, that it wasn't enough. That's amazing. <laughs> uh. Wow. Wow. Hey, it's Leo Laporte. I hope you've enjoyed this little snippet from Security Now. If you want the whole show, you can get it at our website, twit.tv slash SN. Of course, you can subscribe to Security Now on your favorite podcast, or just click one of the links below. Security Now.